Chapter 7. Challenges of Sustainable Development in Nigeria. The starting point here is to peruse the general law principles of sustainable development and outline the Nigeria instrument in place to address the environmental challenges before turning attention to the discourse of the challenges of sustainable development in Nigeria. General law principles of sustainable development principles are usually in the preamble sections of treaties, other instruments and in the jurisprudence of international courts and tribunals. As such, they provide guidance in the interpretations and application of international law generally and international environmental law in particular. A principle expresses a general truth which guides people's actions, serves as a theoretical basis for the various acts of life and the application to reality of which produces a given consequence. The first law principle of sustainable development is preventive. The preventive principle has a longer history and a greater record of acceptance and implementation by states, both on the international plane as well as in the domestic legislations. This principle requires that activity which does or will cause environmental pollution or damage is to be prohibited. The preventive principle therefore seeks to minimize environmental damage by requiring that action be taken at an early stage of the process where possible before such damage has actually occurred. Preventive principle is supported by an extensive body of domestic environmental protection legislations and many international conventions SANS, 1995, 195. At the international level, this is especially significant because the acceptance of this principle means that states are actively constrained against allowing polluting activities within their own national jurisdictions, in addition to their international obligation not to allow activities which cause damage to territories of other states and areas beyond national jurisdiction, Principle 21 of the Stockholm Declaration of 1972 and Principle 2 of the Rio Declaration of 1992. A notable example of this general prohibition against polluting activities is Article 194 of the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea UNCLOS, which enjoins all states to prevent, reduce and control pollution of the marine environment as a whole both within and without the national marine zone jurisdictions. Unlike preventive, the second principle, precautionary is yet to enjoy the same recognition. However, its potential impact on the development of environmental law is immense. In its most progressive formulation, the precautionary principle may be utilized to overturn the traditional burden of proof that is presently weighted in favor of polluters. In the sense that any activity has to be proven to cause pollution before action may be taken to prevent, reduce or control such pollution. The precautionary principle would act to reverse the burden of proof and require any potential polluter to ensure that the activity would not cause pollution before it is allowed to commence. Such an unambiguous approach has been deemed too costly in the short term. Therefore legal formulations of the principle have tended to include a cost-benefit element. For example, Principle 15 of the Rio Declaration 1992 provides that, where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage lack of full scientific certainty shall not be used as a reason for postponing cost-effective measures to prevent environmental degradation. The Climate Change Convention 1992 incorporates a similar formulation of the precautionary principle, see Article 3.3. On the other hand, the 1992 Paris Convention for the Protection of the Marine Environment of the Northeast Atlantic introduced a different formulation of the principle, linking it with the preventive principle namely that preventive measures are to be taken when there are reasonable grounds for concern, 
even when there is no conclusive relationship between inputs and their alleged effects article 2 2 a uh. the different emphasis within these formulations of the precautionary and preventive principles especially with respect to the level of threat to the environment that is required before precautionary action should be taken and the introduction of a cost benefit element to such an action means that there is no uniform understanding of the legal concern of the principles the third principle is polluter pays this principle provides that the costs of environmental pollution should be borne by those whose activities were responsible for causing the pollution. It is possible to consider the application of this principle at both the general and specific levels. At the specific level, it has been held that identified polluters should be required to pay the full costs of the rectification of any environmental degradation that has occurred as a result of their activities. The application of the polluter pays principle in this manner is manifest in the rules governing civil and state liability for environmental damage due to hazardous activities. Examples at the international level include the 1992 Conventions on Civil Liability for Oil Pollution Damage and establishment of an International Fund for Compensation for Oil Pollution Damage replacing the 1969 and 1971 Conventions of the same names, and the 1960 Convention on Third Party Liability in the Field of Nuclear Energy Paris, with 1963 Supplementary convention, Brussels. At the more general level, the polluter pays principle may be seen to act in such a way that all human economic activity which impinges upon the environment should be fully accounted for in the economic pricing system of the goods and services produced by such activity. In economic terms, this process is called the internalization of environmental costs and is potentially much more far-reaching in its impact on human daily lives than the mere provision of full compensation for environmental damage as a result of defined polluting activities. It is significant therefore that it is this version of the polluter pays principle that is included within Principle 16 of the Rio Declaration 1992. It is easy to state this principle but it is very difficult to apply in practice. For example, if a polluter is a large manufacturer, should it be able to pass the costs of its pollution on to its customers in the form of extra charges? Identifying the polluter may also be problematic. For instance, cars cause pollution. But is the polluter the car manufacturer? the car driver, the fuel supplier, the car seller or the road builder. Specifically, and in Nigeria's climb, one may ask if the country has done enough in implementing this principle of polluter pays principle in respect of oil multinationals and industrialists that pollute the environment. How many people have been arrested for pollution crimes in the country? Again, it may be inferred that Nigeria is just beginning to take pollution issues seriously. The principle of citizen participation and the right to a healthy environment is the fourth. This principle is based on the premise that to ensure the effective implementation of environmental laws at all level, individuals should be able to participate in environmental decision making. Principle 1 of the Stockholm Declaration 1972 appears to provide an early basis for such environmental right human has the fundamental right to freedom, equity and adequate conditions to life, in an environment of equality that permits a life of dignity and well-being, and he bears a solemn responsibility to protect and improve the environment for present and future generations. In this respect, Policies promoting or perpetuating apartheid, racial segregation, discrimination, colonial and other forms of oppression and foreign domination stand condemned and must be eliminated.
Such sustainable development principle has received concrete recognition in the UNECE Convention on Access to Information, public participation in decision-making and access to justice in environmental matters, the Aarhus Convention, June 1998. This is the first binding international treaty to recognize the right of every person of present and future generations to live in an environment adequate to his or her health and well-being, Article 1. In Nigerian situation, environmental information must be made readily available and international environmental impact assessment in respect of execution of projects made mandatory at all level of the society. Nigerian people must be empowered to make use of the mechanism of the environmental law principles. In order to promote sustainable development the planet must be established as a common good to all. What does common good mean in this situation? Encyclopedia Britannica describes common good as that which benefits society as a whole, in contrast to the private good of individuals and sections of society. In the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church, 2004 Chapter 4, Part 2 Common Good is summarized as, T. He common good is the good of all people and of the whole person. The human person cannot find fulfillment in himself, that is, apart from the fact that he exists, with others and for others number 165. The goal of life in society is in fact the historically attainable common good, number 168. The compendium further gives statements that communicate what be a partly different sense of the concept, as not only, social conditions, that enable persons to reach fulfillment, but as the end of goal of human life. Gordium A. Spest 1965 states that common good indicates the sum of social conditions which allow people, either as groups or as individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. By way of summary common good involves individuals and groups in society and social conditions that promote their well-being. The environment in which the well-being of all beings is realized and sustained is an indispensable common good that must be maintained. Specifically, common good in the contemporary environmental context that will be discussed below is arranged around the tripod of respect for human person, climate that sustains humanity and national interest of nation-states. Human person as common good human person is an embodied spirit. Through the medium of his body he expresses who he is and enacts his existence. For Pope John Paul II, it is through action that the person reveals himself. Action gives one the best opportunity to appreciate the inherent essence of the person and understand one fully. So the body is something that reveals his, her nature and thereby shares in the dignity of person Chundalikit, 2009, 9. From the Christian scriptural viewpoint the universe was created prior to the creation of human person nonetheless it is to the human person the universe was given to reign over, Gen 1 28. All created things are good in themselves and good for humanity. God created no evil. Evil is not his handiwork. Every creation remains good as it is intrinsically related to the creator. Human person is above the universe and superior to it. As marked with the indelible impression of God's image human is exclusively different from the rest of the universe. Divine image is engraved not merely in his soul alone but rather his body too shares the divine impression. Human's body thus, belongs, to God and so human person cannot be one among many creatures. Accordingly, human person can be understood only in relation with God the creator of heaven and earth. Similarly, this revelation shows human persons as to how they should live on earth and experience their mutual engagements.
The dignity of human person is to be understood in terms of his whole personality, soul and body taken together. Flowing from this, every human person is entitled to all rights as enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations. No wonder then the first principle of the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development affirms that, human beings are at the center of concerns for sustainable development. They are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. Respect and protection of human person therefore is common good even in the contemporary world. The second common good is climate. Climate as common good climate is common good. It belongs to all and meant for all and a devastating abuse of it can lead to the disintegration of the planet. At the global level, it is a complex system linked to many of the essential conditions for human life. The atmosphere is a thin layer that envelops the earth and human activities predominantly take place within it. The atmosphere consists of 4% CO, 21% oxygen and 75% nitrogen oxide. A balance must exist among these gases for everything to be normal on Earth. The Earth maintains an optimal temperature range of between 15 C and 35 C for the sustenance of life. A constant salinity of the sea at approximately 3.4% is required since a salt content higher than 6% will terminate all sea lives. Maintenance of a protective layer of ozone at the stratosphere to shield the Earth's surface from ultraviolet radiation of the sun is also required hence climate is common good for all. National interest of nation states as common good The importance of national interest of nation states may not be fully comprehended outside the international system. Arguably, the contemporary state system dates to the Treaty of Westphalia of 1648 that ended the Thirty Years' War in Europe. The treaty recognized the major European units at the time, the Holy Roman Empire, the German kingdoms, the Netherlands, Spain, France, and the Dutch Republic as sovereign states. They enjoyed the right to determine their own official religions, and citizens who did not practice the official religion were given the freedom of religion with some restrictions. The concept of sovereignty included territorial integrity, non-intervention by another nation and political self-determination. By granting independence to all dependencies and with the collapse of the empire, all former units were regarded as politically equal and not answerable to any superior authority. Before then, relations between the units in the above systems were conducted in the name of the Pope or monarchs, dukes or duchesses, as the case may be Gross, 1948, 20-41. However, the broad agreement among scholars regarding the Western origin of the international political system does not imply that there were no other systems before the 1648. There were several systems such as the Greek city-states, the imperial Chinese system, the Indian state system, the Roman and Byzantine empires, the Mali and Songhai empires in West Africa, to mention but a few. By the 19th century, states have become the primary institutional agents in an interstate Western system of relations Osiander, 2001, 251-287. According to Frankel, 1973, international system consists of several units that interact. For further explanation Frankel maintained that, these units conduct their relations not in a vacuum but within a broader system which evolves its own structure, norms and behaviors. 
What is clear is that international system has units, states and non-state actors such as multinational corporations, international organizations and even eminent personalities, which are in constant interaction, with rules and norms of behaviors. Nation-state interest ideology in action dominantly affects the reality of the contemporary world stage. Therefore, the pursuit of interest of nation-states is indispensable in intra- and inter-state relations if the fundamental responsibility of nations, security, to their citizens must be fulfilled. However, the search for national interest by various countries particularly in relation to common good of the peoples of the world may become problematic. In this wise it is necessary to understand national interest ideology of nation-states in context. National interest ideology of nation-states and ideology is a set of conscious and unconscious ideas that constitute one's goals, expectations, and actions. It can also be described as a comprehensive vision, a way of looking at things compare worldview, as in several philosophical tendencies, or a set of ideas proposed by the dominant class of a society to all members of this society, a received consciousness, or product of socialization. Also ideologies can be seen as systems of abstract thought applied to public matters and thus make this concept central to politics. Implicitly every political or economic tendency entails an ideology whether it is propounded as an explicit system of thought Wikipedia, accessed on 25 July 2013. Accordingly, many political parties base the political actions and programs on an ideology. In that context, their political ideology entails some certain ethical set of ideals, principles, doctrines, myths, or symbols of a social movement, institution, class, or large group that explains how society should work and offers some political and cultural blueprint for a certain social order. A political ideology largely concerns itself with how to allocate power and to what ends it should be used. Some parties follow a certain ideology very closely, while others may take a broad inspiration from a group of related ideologies without specifically embracing any one of them. Political ideologies have two dimensions namely goals, that is, how society should work and methods, that is, the most appropriate ways to achieve the ideal arrangement. Typically, each political ideology contains certain ideas on what it considers to be the best form of government e.g. democracy, theocracy, caliphate, etc. and the best economic system e.g. capitalism, socialism, mixed economy, etc. Ideologies also identify themselves by their position on the political spectrum such as the left, the center or the right though this is very often controversial. Ideologies can be distinguished from political strategies e.g. populism and from single issues around which a party may be built. Political ideologies are concerned with many different aspects of a society, some of which are the economy, education, health care, labor law, criminal law, the justice system, the provision of social security and social welfare, trade, the environment, minors, immigration, race, use of the military, patriotism, and established religion. Invariably, ideology has become synonymous with national interest of nation-states. Accordingly, Promotion of national interest or national ideology or national interest ideology is now the raison d'etat of the existence of any state in the first instance. While the promotion of interest of a country as well as its citizens is paramount and must be supported, 
Dogmatic and religio-cultural elements of national interest ideology as found in the communist world of the past may not find a home in the politics of developing countries that accept the reality of the transcendent. With this basic understanding of ideology and national state interest, it may be argued that every nation-state can accommodate anything and everything can be appropriated to become national interest or its common good. Given the challenge of climate change, death of the planet Earth as the ultimate end, finding solutions speedily to the challenges of climate change should be targeted as national interest of all the states both in domestic and international politics. Therefore, Every nation-state that wants to be in existence and work for the well-being of its citizens must embrace survival of the planet, a challenge expressed in the gab of climate change, as its common good especially in its global and interstate relations. The legislative and institutional framework of environmental protection and remediation in Nigeria Criminal Code Acts the right to property is recognized and constitutionally realizable and guaranteed under Chapter 4 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. A movable property like land is inclusive and provided for by the Constitution. It follows therefore that any infringement on these rights of persons will result into legal action. Such infringement could be as a result of an unlawful act to such property and an unlawful act to property is defined under Section 440 of the Criminal Code Act to mean an act which causes injury to the property of another and which is done without his consents is unlawful, unless it is authorized or justified by law. Section 234 F of the Criminal Code Act Cap 42 of 1958 has made environmental pollution a criminal offense with stiff penalties under the Criminal Code Act. The penalty may carry six months imprisonment. Oil in Navigable Waters ONWA, Act The Act is the first law that deals specifically and solely with the industrial waste generated by oil production. It is concerned with the discharge of oil from ships. In WUFO 20I0 argued that the enforcement of this legislation has been watered down by several loopholes in its provision through which offenders may wriggle through. Igbokwe 2001 contended that the penalties prescribed in the Act are too lenient on offenders and apart from ineffective enforcement of the laws contained in the Act, they find it cheaper to breach the laws and pay ridiculously low fines than adhere to them. The Act is also to be operated or regulated and enforced by the Minister and Ministry of Transport who may appoint inspectors to report to him and for the purposes of enforcement of the Act. The Act prohibits the discharge of crude oil, fuel, lubricating oil, heavy diesel oil and any mixture containing not less than 100 parts of oil, etc. into prohibited seas areas by Nigerian ships otherwise the owner or master of the ship shall be guilty of an offence subject to the provisions of the Act. It designates prohibited areas of the sea and empowers the Minister of Transport to designate by order other areas, outside the prohibited areas of the sea and Nigerian territorial waters, as prohibited areas for the purpose of protecting the coast and territorial waters of Nigeria from pollution by oil, and to vary or exclude any prohibited area as such. The Oil in Navigable Waters Act it makes the owner or master of the vessel, the occupier of a place on land or the person in charge of the apparatus used for transferring oil from or to a vessel guilty of an offence, 
If any oil or mixture containing oil is discharged into the whole of the sea within the seaward limits of the territorial waters of Nigeria, and all other waters, including inland waters, which are within those limits and are navigable by seagoing ships. However, Section 33152 provides the singular exception with regard to the discharge of dangerous petroleum only, wherein it authorizes the harbor authority to appoint a place within its jurisdiction where the ballast water of vessels in which a cargo of dangerous petroleum has been carried may be discharged into the waters of the harbor, at such times, and subject to such conditions as the authority may determine. Accordingly, by this exception, the ballast water of vessels in which dangerous petroleum had been carried which might have a mixture of oil, can be discharged legally into the waters of the harbour under this subsection. It is apparent that ONWA is concerned with territorial waters of Nigeria. Considering the nature of oil pollution, a question that may arise is what of the near sea outside the territorial waters of Nigeria, of those oil terminals outside the prohibited sea areas and designated prohibited sea areas, how would such navigable waters be protected from oil pollution? These questions were answered adequately by the Oil Terminal Dues Act, which at Section 6 thereto makes the provisions of Section 3 of the ONWA applicable in any area within which any oil terminal is situated, even if it is situated outside the limits of the territorial waters of Nigeria. Apart from the exception already mentioned above, the Act provides several special defenses for offenders of the provisions of Sections 1 and 3. The special defenses are as follows, a. That oil or mixture of oil was discharged for the purpose of securing the safety of any vessel, or of preventing damage to any vessel or cargo or of saving life, b. That the oil or mixture escaped in consequence of damage to the vessel and that as soon as practicable after the damage occurred all reasonable steps were taken to prevent or, if it could not be prevented, for stopping or reducing, the escape or oil or mixture. C. That the oil or mixture escaped by reason of leakage. That the leakage was not due to any want of reasonable care and that as soon as practicable after the escape was discovered all reasonable steps were taken for stopping or reducing it. d. That the escape of the oil or mixture from a place on land or from apparatus used for transferring oil from or to a vessel was not due to any want of reasonable care, and that as soon as practicable after the escape was discovered all reasonable steps were taken for stopping or reducing it. With regard to discharge or escape from a place on land that at the discharge was caused by the act of a person who was in that place without the permission, express or implied, of the occupier, b. The oil was contained in an effluent produced by operations for the refining or oil, c. That it was not reasonably practicable to dispose of the effluent otherwise than by discharging it into waters of Nigeria, d. All reasonable practicable steps had been taken for eliminating oil from the effluent. e. Finally, a discharge will not constitute an offence where it is in exercise of any power conferred by statute, e.g. sections 368 and 382 of the Merchant Shipping Act, which relate to the removal of wrecks by the receiver of wreck, etc., unless it is shown that the person or authority failed to take such steps, if any, as were reasonable in the circumstances preventing, stopping or reducing the discharge. However, it must be noted that these special defences are all rebuttable. Just as shown in the last defence, for instance with regard to the first special defence, if the court is satisfied that the discharge was not for any of the reasons or purposes stated therein the defence will collapse, and the accused will be found guilty and convicted. Furthermore, 
Inasmuch as these special defenses expose the delicate environment to hazards and pollution which the Convention and the Act sought to prevent, what aggravates the sordid state of affairs is the ludicrously low penalties which range from N20 to N2000 in the Act which will not serve as a deterrent to anyone let alone the wealthy multinationals involved in the oil sector and shipping. These fines provided against offences in the Act are, to say the least, antiquated and insufficient. Although found in the laws of the Federation, 2004 but to regard them as punishments is of a great fallacy. Apparently, they must be penalties that were imposed when the Act was first enacted in the 1960s and were just carried over to 2004 due to the laxity and laziness of the legislature. They were not beefed up or raised as to be contemporaneous to the realities of this era. Accordingly, even if an offender is convicted he will laugh off the penalty's punishment, thereby exposing Nigeria environment to more danger if left alone to this law. The law would have greater bite if these penalties were reviewed upward to bring it in tune with contemporary realities. Another latent impediment and defect worthy of note herein, with regard to punishment or prosecution is that every prosecution under the Act is with the consent of the Attorney General of the Federation. Secondly going for his approval before every prosecution will lead to delay and justice delayed is justice denied, more so in oil and gas sector where delay in judicial settlement of cases has, by far, grave consequences for human, health and national security. Moreover, the environment is the heritage of every person and not just that of the minister or his appointed inspector alone and all hands ought to be on deck to protect if. Hence, there is need that provisions should be made in these laws for the individual or community to participate in environmental protection and control through actions in court. National Oil Spill Detection and Response Agency NOSDRA is established in 2006 Act, CAP N157, LFN 2006 and is a specialized and principal legislation on environmental protection in the oil and gas sector in Nigeria. The Act established the National Oil Spill Detection and Response Agency with responsibility for preparedness, detection and response to all oil spillages in Nigeria. It also established the advisory, monitoring, evaluating, mediating and coordinating arm of NOSDRA known as the National Control and Response Center NCRC-92. The NOSDRA Act provides that the objectives of NOSDRA shall be to coordinate and implement the National Oil Spill Contingency Plan for Nigeria as may be formulated, or revised, from time to time. The objectives include a safe, timely, effective and appropriate response to major or disastrous oil pollution, B. Identify high-risk areas as well as priority areas for protection and cleanup. C. Establish the mechanism to monitor and assist or where expedient direct the response including the capability to mobilizing the necessary resources to protect threatened environment and clean up to the best practical extent the impacted site. D. Maximize the effective use of the available facilities and resources of corporate bodies, their international connections and oil spill cooperatives, that is Clean Nigeria Associates in implementing appropriate spill response. E. Ensure funding and appropriate and sufficient pre-positioned pollution combating equipment and materials, as well as functional communication network system required for effective response to major oil pollution. F. Provide a program of activation, training and drill exercise to ensure readiness to oil pollution preparedness and response and the management and operational personnel. G. Cooperate and provide advisory services, 
technical support and equipment for purposes of responding to major oil pollution incident in the West African sub-region upon request by any neighboring country, particularly where a part or the Nigerian territory may be threatened. H provide support for research and development R&D in the local development or methods materials and equipment for oil spill detection and response I cooperate with the International Maritime Organization and other national regional and international organizations in the promotion and exchange of results of research and development program relating to the enhancement of the state of the art of the oil pollution preparedness and response, including technologies, techniques for surveillance, containment, recovery, disposal and cleanup to the best practical extent. J. Establish agreements with neighboring countries regarding the rapid movement of equipment, personnel and supplies into and out of the countries for emergency oil spill response activities. K. Determine and preposition vital combat equipment at most strategic areas for rapid response. I. Establish procedures by which the Nigerian Customs Service and the Nigerian Immigration Services shall ensure rapid importation of extra support response equipment and personnel. M. Develop and implement an appropriate audit system for the entire plan. N. Carry out such other activities as are necessary or expedient for the full discharge of its functions and the execution of the plan under this Act. The penalty provided in the NOSDRA Act is only against the oil spiller. From the language of the section, it appears that the only oil spiller in view is the corporate or oil producing company or tanker owner and not the individual who for example perforates an oil pipeline to siphon petroleum products and eventually left it open thereby causing oil spillage. It provides that an oil spiller is by this act to report an oil spill to the agency in writing not later than 24 hours after the occurrence of an oil spill, in default of which the failure to report shall attract a penalty in the sum of 500,000 naira for each day of failure to report the occurrence. The failure to clean up the impacted site, to all practical extent including remediation, shall also attract a fine of 1 million naira. The foregoing is about the only penalty provided in the NOSDRA Act with regard to environmental pollution in relation to oil spillage. It appears this penalty is not meant to include the individual spiller or does it mean that such an individual will equally report, clean up and remediate the impacted site if apprehended. Or if a criminal perforates an oil pipeline causing an oil spill and escapes, will the oil pipeline owner be responsible for the oil spill? considering that he didn't cause, the spill on the one hand and the tortuous responsibility, strict liability, for the escape of a dangerous thing in his custody and ownership of same on the other. This inasmuch as the individual criminal will be punished if apprehended, but his punishment would be different and may not include to remedy the site of spillage but to put him to death or behind bars see section 2. Petroleum Production and Distribution Anti-Sabotage Act, Cap P-12, LFN 2004-1251996-4 NWLR-659. However, the oil pipeline owner would be responsible for any such spillage and would be accountable for the spill where the statutory exceptions are excluded. National Environmental Standards and Regulations Enforcement Agency Establishment NESREA Act 2007. The Act NESREA establishes the National Environmental Standards and Regulation Enforcement and it is currently the major federal body charged with the protection of Nigeria's environment. NESREA was created to replace the defunct Federal Environmental Protection Agency FEPA. 
Section 7 a, states that the agency is authorized to enforce compliance with laws, guidelines, policies and standards of environmental matters. Its authority extends to the enforcement of environmental guidelines and policies, such as the National Policy on the Environment, 1999, Ladin, 2012. As an agency of the Federal Ministry of Environment it is charged with the responsibility of enforcing environmental laws, regulations and standard in deterring people, industries and organization from polluting and degrading the environment. It was signed into law and published in the official Gazette No. 92, Volume 94 of 31 July 2007. The Act has the responsibility for the protection and development of the environment, biodiversity conservation and sustainable development of Nigeria's natural resources in general and environmental technology including coordination, and liaison with relevant stakeholders within and outside Nigeria on matters of enforcement of environmental standards, regulating, rules, laws, policies and guidelines. The agency has the mission to ensure a cleaner and healthier environment for Nigerian, to inspire personal and collective responsibility in building an environmentally conscious society for the achievement of sustainable development in Nigeria. The functions of the agency A. Enforce compliance with laws, guidelines, policies and standards on environmental matters. B. Coordinate and liaise with stakeholders, within and outside Nigeria on matters of environmental standards, regulations and enforcement. c. Enforce compliance with the provisions of international agreements, protocols, conventions and treats on the conservation including climate change, biodiversity conservation, desertification, forestry, oil and gas, chemicals hazardous wastes, ozone depletion, marine and wildlife, pollution, sanitation and such other environmental agreements as may from time to time come into force. The powers of the agency The agency is empowered to a. Prohibit processes and use of equipment or technology that undermine environmental quality. b. Conduct field follow-up of compliance with set standards and take procedures prescribed by law against any violator and c. Subject to the provision of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999 and in collaboration with relevant judicial authorities establish mobile courts to expeditiously dispense cases of violation of environmental regulation. Environmental guidelines and standards for the petroleum industry in Nigeria, e.g. ASPIN. The Nigerian Department of Petroleum Resources DPR, the department primarily responsible for regulating the oil industry promulgated environmental guidelines and standards for the petroleum industry, e.g. ASPIN, in 1991. Regarding oil spills, e.g. ASPIN requires that oil companies commence cleanup within 24 hours of the occurrence of a spill where a spill is on inland waters or wetlands www.nesria.com.gov.ng. The 12th of May 2017. The only option for cleanup is complete containment and removal. Operators must conduct their cleanup efforts in a way that does not cause additional harm to the environment. Con. 2014. Petroleum Drilling and Production Regulations. 1969. The Petroleum Drilling and Production Regulations. 1969 provides in Section 25 that licenses and lessees should take prompt steps to control oil pollution where it occurs and, if possible, end it. Apart from statutory enactments regarding liability for environmental pollution, there is liability for environmental pollution under the common law principles of law of torts that is, trespass, 
negligence, res ipso facto, public and private nuisance. All of these have been used to recover damages in cases of oil spill litigated through the courts. They are also applicable in environmental pollution claims. Other legislations germane to environmental protection in the oil and gas sector include the Petroleum Act, I-3, Oil in Navigable Waters Act, Merchant Shipping Act, 131, Nigerian Metrological Establishment, etc. Act, 134 and Associated Gas Reinjection Act. Petroleum Act under this Act. The Minister and Ministry of Petroleum Resources have a role in environmental protection in the oil and gas sector. Accordingly, under this statute, the Minister of Petroleum Resources may make regulations providing generally for matters relating to licenses and leases granted under this Act and operations carried out there including the prevention of pollution of water courses and atmosphere. Furthermore, the said Minister of Petroleum Resources may also make regulations a regulating the importation, handling, storage and distribution of petroleum, petroleum products and other flammable oils and liquids, and in particular, without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing defining dangerous petroleum and dangerous petroleum products, prescribing anchorages for ships carrying dangerous petroleum or dangerous petroleum products as cargo and requiring those ships to proceed to and remain at those anchorages, b. regulating the loading, unloading, transport within a port, landing of shipment of petroleum and petroleum products, and c. Prescribing conditions and restrictions to be imposed upon vessels arriving at a port after having carried petroleum, petroleum products, dangerous petroleum or dangerous petroleum products. It may be pertinent to point out that the present regulations made pursuant to Section 9 by the Minister of Petroleum Resources made elaborate provisions for the transportation, handling, storage, etc. of all petroleum products. Thus, strict compliance to the Act and its regulations may engender safe handling of petroleum and its products and thereby prevent pollution of water courses and the atmosphere. The said regulation however, did not make direct and provisions on the prevention and impacted sites remediation or pollution of water courses and the atmosphere. Furthermore, with regard to environmental protection in relation to oil pipelines, the Minister of Petroleum may by regulation prescribe measures in respect of public safety, the avoidance of interference with works of public utility in, over and under any land and the prevention of pollution of any land or water, such matters relating to the construction, Nigerian Meteorological Agency NIMET establishment, etc. Act The Act was established by Section I, Nigerian Meteorological Agency establishment, etc. Act Cap NI 52 LFN, 2004. This Act is equally of strategic importance in pollution control and environmental protection in the oil and gas sector is the Nigerian Meteorological Agency, a parastatal of the Federal Ministry of Aviation. Accordingly, of the deluge of functions that the agency is saddled with by Section 7 of the Act with regard to environmental protection and ancillary matters in the oil industry sector, it provides that the agency shall 1. Issue weather forecasts for the safe operation of the aircrafts, ocean-going vessels and oil industry. 2. Provide weather services in marine environmental pollution and biometeorology for climatic and human health activities. 3. Proffer advice to the federal and state governments on seismological activities. And 4. Monitor metrological components of environmental pollution and ozone concentration. 
The agency prescribes climatic requirements for diverse sectoral activities inclusive of environment and relief management. For instance, there is the Tier 3 oil spill combat and remediation which is a consummate disaster. From the foregoing provisions the agency is therefore involved in environmental protection in the oil and gas sector. The agency's involvement and relevance as a strategic player in the sector is made obvious by the duties mandatorily vested on its parent ministry, the Federal Ministry of Aviation. This is done by the National Oil Spill Contingency Plan and in the second schedule to the NOSDRA Act during a major Tier 2 and Tier 3 oil spill combat and remediation. This was to be accompanied by providing regularly data on the prevailing weather conditions and making predictions on weather changes. Associated Gas Reinjection Act 1979 The Associated Gas Reinjection Act deals with the gas flaring activities of oil and gas companies in Nigeria, ELRI, 2015. The gas reinjection decree stipulates a fine of 10 US cents per 1,000 cubic feet of gas flared compared to the $10 fine charged in Western countries. The aim of the act is to eliminate gas flaring through reinjection and viable utilization of all produced associated gas. Furthermore, the following agencies are involved in environmental protection in Nigeria. The agencies are the National Oil Spill Detection and Response Agency, the Nigerian Maritime Administrative and Safety Agency, Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, Nigerian Ports Authority, Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps and the Federal Ministry of Transport. Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency NIMASA, with regard to environmental protection in the oil and gas sector, the provisions of the NIMASA Act granted NIMASA jurisdiction thereto as it provides, that the objectives of the agency shall be to regulate and promote maritime safety, security, marine pollution and maritime labor. Thus in pursuit of this objective the Act provides that the agency shall I. Establish maritime training and safety standards. E. Provide directions and ensure compliance with vessel security measures. E. Carry out air and coastal surveillance. Control and prevent marine pollutions. IV. Inspect ships for the purposes of maritime safety, maritime security, maritime labor and prevention of pollution, and v. Generally to perform any other duty for ensuring maritime safety and security or do all matters incidental thereto. The jurisdiction of NIMASA in environmental protection in oil and gas sector therefore stems from two points provided in the objectives of the agency. First of all, oil spill is inimical to maritime safety and secondly, it is marine pollution. Therefore, to achieve the objective of regulating and promoting marine pollution and maritime labor, the agency ought to get involved in environmental protection in oil and gas sector. This it can do by making regulations with regard to pollution. It is submitted that such regulations may include directives as to safety measures in oil tankers and oil drilling in Thank the maritime zone. Thank you for zone. visiting this channel, but Environmental Tonic by Professor Dr. Noizhola OP for continuation of Chapter 7 of the book, Sustainable Development, Issues and Challenges for Nigeria, visit Amazon publication or get a copy of the textbook. Thank you. Chapter 8 of the video book is already running on this channel. Thank you.